This is the coming revolution in higher consciousness. Listen now to Elizabeth Clare Prophet, educator, author, and authority on the most exciting story of our time, the coming revolution in higher consciousness. It is wonderful to be with you here in Kansas City to celebrate the ascension of the Lord and Savior of the Piscean Age, Jesus Christ. Truly our friend and our brother, one who said before Abraham was, I am. And in the beginning as in the ending, we are in the heart of this Christ the Son of Man who made plain the way of the individualization of that Christ flame. Through his great example, our souls are restored to the path of union with this universal Christ, this Bridegroom. And through that union, we may follow him all the way in the resurrection and the ascension. For those on the path of an inner walk with Christ. This truly is a day of days of all the year itself. This is the culmination of his descent into matter, his victory unto the light. We will take up then this evening the sweet teachings of Jesus' lost years, his tarrying with us on the earth, the teachings that are recorded in scripture and the teachings that were left out of scripture concerning this very important subject of Jesus ascension and Christ's resurrection in you. The relevancy of Jesus ascension is only made clear when we realize that we are intended to follow in his footsteps. Since I was a very small child I was determined to know and to understand the meaning of this passage. Jesus said, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. My meditation upon this word has brought me to the sacred heart of Jesus, to this mission, to the quickening of an ancient memory of having been called long ago to be one of the ones who would restore in this age the mysteries that are sacred, the years that have not been recorded, the teachings that have been lost, and to deliver the word. I know you are here because you have heard the call of your Lord within, and that you desire to know the mysteries of God which is written in Revelation should be finished, to know the everlasting gospel that the angel comes with in the heavens carrying that everlasting gospel. It is an hour when the heavens open, the archangels speak to us, and they do reveal the mystery of Christhood for every son and daughter of God upon earth. This is the rejoicing of the end of this age. This is the reason we give a great shout to the heavens and cry, Alleluia, for the Lord is risen, and he is risen in me this day. I would like then to simply give to you the simple recordings that we are left with in the sacred scriptures, and then go on with what we may build upon them. Mark concludes his gospel simply saying, So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. 
And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Therefore we expect, even today, this one who ascended to heaven, this ascended Master Jesus Christ, is walking and working with us with signs following. Never apart from us, we understand the meaning of his presence, that he desires to work his works through each one of us because he has risen to the Father. Luke concludes, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. We tarry in the city four square, the city four square of matter. We tarry in the base of our pyramid, for we are waiting for that fullness of the Holy Ghost upon us, each one, for only by God can we deliver the living word of a living Savior. And so he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God because his spirit was with them. We rejoice because God is with us and we see in the land today many who have no joy and no rejoicing for the heaviness of world karma that is upon them. We have acute clinic depression. We have every form of disease. We have cynicism. We have drugs in our temples and impure foods. All of these things weigh down the people. Where is the joy of the Lord? It can be found in his lost teachings. That is why we must drink at that fount. We must know what he spoke and we must remember that Jesus promised to send us another comforter. And this comforter would come as the enlightener to bring to our remembrance what I have said to you. Everything that I have taught you, Jesus said, the comforter will bring to your remembrance. I believe that many of you walked and talked with Jesus 2,000 years ago, and this is why you believe in the fullness of his glory unto yourself in this day and age. And I believe you understand what it means to be reminded of what Jesus told you long ago, or two centuries ago, or 10,000 years ago. For Jesus is the I Am who was with us in the beginning and before Abraham was. Always the world teacher and the one who would prod us to discover the inner Christ within ourselves. So bringing to our remembrance his lost teachings, we know that none can take them from us. Finally, Luke records in the book of Acts the scene that we would recreate and re-experience this evening. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, pertaining to the consciousness of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with a Holy Ghost, not many days hence. The baptism by the Holy Ghost is the experience of the mystics, of those who understand that that spirit within us is a magnet for the spirit descending, 
the true baptism of the Holy Ghost is not only a conversion, but it is a rescue of our souls. It is the opening of a life that is only lived in God and in Christ and in all of the heavenly hosts and saints, the saints robed in white who are known as the Great White Brotherhood. This brotherhood of saints consists of those who have followed Jesus in this ritual of the Ascension, which we celebrate this evening. Hence, they are called Ascended Masters. And these are those, such as you and I, who are passing through earth as pilgrims, pilgrims who love peace and freedom, and who understand that there is a mission to be fulfilled, there are things to be resolved, and there is another world waiting. We are very much in physical embodiment and very much desirous of bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth while we are here. We are not otherworldly, but we desire to take the truth of God and to prove that it makes a difference. To set an example to show that in everything that people do, God is there and his holiness is in them if they will but celebrate it and cherish it. And so the receiving of the Holy Ghost is something we seek daily because it is not a one-time event, because the Spirit increases as we are able to receive it. And the more we receive of that Spirit, the more we are transformed and healed, the more light the cells of the body contain, the more we are illumined. And so it is a never-ending process until the hour when this body can no lo longer contain the light that the soul has magnetized and therefore the soul exchanges the terrestrial body for the celestial, the earthly body for the heavenly. It is an altogether natural transition and a natural graduation from a schoolroom where we shall have learned life's lessons and be prepared for a continuing service. This account then in the book of Acts is this event that took place in the life of Jesus. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Israel then is a people, a seed of light and of Christ who descended, descended through Abraham, were dispersed to the nations and have regathered again on this North American continent as the 12 lost tribes. The restoration of the consciousness to this seed of light. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Think about this commandment that he gave in the uttermost parts of the earth, why the uttermost parts of the earth were not even discovered at that time. Does it not suggest a continuing mission of many lifetimes affirming the Christ throughout 2,000 years of the dispensation of Jesus coming. He came so that in 2,000 years, the evolutions of this planet might follow his example and understand that the real reason for life, every day of it, from the moment the Holy Spirit breathes the breath of life into the newborn babe until the time he withdraws it when the soul must retire. Every moment is for proving the victory of this inner potential from the divine spark, the potential of personal Christhood. Now are we the sons of God, said John the beloved disciple. And it hath not yet appeared what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now are we the sons of God. But there is only one begotten Son of God. It is the universal Christ. 
Therefore the many sons of God are intended to be the breaking of the bread of life of this whole loaf of the cosmic Christ. Each individual one of us then putting on, identifying with and realizing that universal Christ. There is one Lord, one Christ, but many vessels, infinite vessels to pour an infinite light. God is where you are, lawfully and truly, according to the true teachings of Jesus. So to the uttermost parts of the earth, we are called not merely to speak the word, but to be it. It is the only way anyone will ever be convinced that this is a present possibility. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel which also said, Ye men of Galilee, ye men and women of Kansas City, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. This is a prophecy, not only of the second coming of Christ that the world attends, but it is a prophecy of the Christ's descent into your temple, for he desires to ascend once more, and that is through you. Christ's ascension in you takes place when the Son of God descends, and you welcome him because your temple is ready cleansed by the violet flame, revealed to us by Saint Germain, purified by the Holy Spirit, filled with love and good works, understanding and joy. He shall come in like manner as we have seen him go, when individually, one by one, we are ready. Saints who have received this light are ascending even today in this century. They have been ascending in every century because when the pupil is ready, the teacher appears. Not at some predestined date at 2001 or 1987 or 1901. Of course, if you weren't born, you would have missed it. No, when your soul is ready, so he comes and descends where you are, where you are, and you know it, because forevermore the joy of the Lord is with you. I would like to backtrack a little bit in the life of Jesus, because some people desire proof, proof to know that there really are lost teachings, why do we need any more teachings than those that are found in the four Gospels and in the Epistles and in Revelation? Why should there be progressive revelation? Why should you be talking with Jesus Christ today since it's all been written down and that's all we need? Well, do you know Jesus has a right to speak to you if he wants to? And there are no laws of orthodoxy that can bind Jesus from speaking to his own. It is written in scripture, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox. Some have attempted to muzzle Jesus and say, he cannot be speaking to you or through you or in your heart because when the good book was written, it was finished. Jesus doesn't say that. He says, I will bring you another comforter. So there are human rights and divine rights. As you know, many are championing your human rights, but I would like you to think of me as a champion of your divine rights. You have a divine right then to hear the voice of the Son of God and live. You have a right to know him face to face 
if you are ready for the initiation. The scripture says no man can see the face of God and live. The lost teaching of Jesus on this subject is, no man can see the face of God and live as man. You must forever thereafter live as a manifestation of God. For the light will so shine upon you that can, you can no longer revert to the ways of the human. It is your divine right to know where Jesus was between the ages of 12 and 29. Scripture makes no mention of them, and yet those who have come back from the Far East with a message of his journey, reporting this to Rome, have been told at least a century ago that there are at least 63 documents in the Vatican brought back from various travelers speaking of Jesus journey we have a right to know why Rome should not impart this information to us and to think for a moment why the most powerful church in the world would not want its members to know what Jesus did between the age of 12 and 29 I have some thoughts on this subject I have not intruded those personal thoughts in the book that I have written for you but I would like to tell you about that book and give you a very brief summary of its conclusions this is the lost years of Jesus in paperback form for those who cherish it I have also put it in a bound volume Three years of ongoing extensive research by myself and my staff uncovering the facts disclosed herein bring us a historical document of a historical Jesus. This belongs to everyone because Jesus is a major historical figure about which we do not have a lot of history. It doesn't belong to Christians alone, but it belongs to Christians without doctrine or dogma or narrow lines of confinement simply the awareness that the Son of Man walked rode went to the Far East what he did there the follow-up to the lost years of Jesus is the two volumes set on the lost teachings of Jesus also in paperback and bound the lost teachings of Jesus begins with an analysis in the first book in the introduction of how we know that there are lost teachings from the very New Testament itself and other documents why we should suppose there are lost teachings and then it proceeds to give those teachings as they have been given to us Mark Prophet and myself through that great comforter and enlightener through the Holy Spirit through the Lord himself so these two volumes give a step-by-step -step unfoldment of a very practical and easy reading day-by-day -day account of Jesus teaching told in anecdote and story bringing together the mysteries of the Far East that Jesus brought back with him it is not pedantic and does not pretend to be based upon physical sources for these except from what we have of Gnosticism and the texts that have been found in this century are all but lost but most of all what we find is that Jesus himself as well as the Apostles instructed that these mysteries should never be written down they have not been written down because they are intended to be given by Jesus Christ at the end of the age they have been placed in our hearts they are placed in the heart of any initiate who is truly an initiate and truly understands what is that walk with the living Savior it is wonderful as many people have written to us and told us to read of the lost years and the lost teachings and to understand that what they have been thinking for many many years receiving meditating on has been confirmed by others has been written down somehow when you have these books as a guidebook and as stepping stones you can accelerate much more quickly into your own communion with the Lord that is how we see ourselves 
as messengers of the Great White Brotherhood, as facilitating your reconnecting with your I Am Presence and the heavenly hosts, which is your divine right, reminding you, giving you a little poke, a little push, and saying, look, this is the easy way home. Not sorrow and suffering and travail and the Via Dolorosa, but there is a way to union with God and you can attain it in this age, for this is the hour of your victory and the hour is truly come. And so we take a brief look at the lost years before we go on with the mysteries of Christ's ascension. The historical problem is that there is no record of Jesus' whereabouts between the age of 12, when he was in the temple in Jerusalem, and about the age 30 in Jordan. First we'll show you the picture of Jesus journeying to Ladakh in the Far East, which is on the cover of the book. This picture was inspired upon me by Jesus. He showed me this vision of himself and said, I desire to have this painted by an artist. And so each one can imagine the face of Jesus, the teenager. It's wonderful to think of him as a teenager and to know that our teenagers and those across the world have a great mission and a quest and a discovery that they can be on. Because these years and teachings are lost, this is not brought to their attention. The teenage years are a very sensitive age of a quest for identity. That is what we have to remember when we see our teenagers getting in all, to all kinds of things, going into the fads of clothing or the changing mores. Whatever they are seeking, perhaps through drugs, they are seeking to know who they are and what they are, and they seek it in one another. They seek their peer approval. But what they are really seeking is their own personal Christhood, their real self. It is ours to give it to them and to be reminders to them that one like themselves, not a god, not a jack-in-the-box who was born and jumped out of that jack-in-the-box, suddenly a god beyond all of us, but a son of man who came to prove the way and faced all of the trials and temptations that we must face. He came as the savior, but remember, he also came with a human element. Buddhist manuscripts say that Jesus was in India during the lost years. First we see him in the temple as a boy, and then we see him as the man. And we realize that in that period of time, he has internalized a greater and greater element of the word, the eternal Christ the putting on of Christhood from that age of 12, which we'll go back to now because I want you to meditate upon just how great is the Christhood of this one at 12, and yet how much he realizes that he must journey before he can stand before the Sanhedrin and the Roman Council and can pass through the profound initiation of the crucifixion. Just as he has the understanding to dispute these doctors and discourse with them, asking and answering his questions, their questions. So he is wise enough to know that there is a call that is calling his soul, and that call comes out of the high Himalayas. Buddhist manuscripts say that Jesus was in India during the lost years. These were originally recorded in Pali, the sacred language of the Theravada Buddhist canon. They were later translated into Tibetan. These manuscripts were discovered in 1887, 100 years ago, by Nicholas Notovich. He was a Russian journalist. He found them at Himis, a Buddhist monastery near Leh, Ladakh. Wonder of wonders, but Swami Abedananda a well-known scholar saw the same documents at Himis in 1922. Nicholas Rorick, another Russian, saw the same or similar documents in 1925. Rorick also discovered Jesus' journey to the East 
recorded in the oral history of the region. He wrote, in what possible way could a recent forgery penetrate the consciousness of the whole East? And where is the scientist who could write a long treatise in Pali and Tibetan? We do not know such an one. Rorick was speaking about the fact that wherever he went in his journey of five years throughout that region, everyone had heard of Saint Isa, as they called Jesus. Everyone knew the legend of this one, this great light who had come to their land almost 2,000 years ago, and they knew the story of his return to Palestine. Some of these people are illiterate. How then does a forgery permeate the consciousness of the entire Far East? In 1939, the librarian at Himis presented a set of parchments to Mrs. Clarence Gask and Elizabeth Kaspari. They were on a pilgrimage. They did not know that they would come upon these manuscripts. They did not know they existed. But as they had been guests at Himis, on their last day there, the librarian came out and on the roof said to them, these books say your Jesus was here. As recently as 1951, Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas traveled to Himis. This was the last bit of information I picked up before concluding this book. He wrote, there are those who to this day believe that Jesus visited the place, that he came here when he was 14 and left when he was 28, heading west to be heard of no more. The legend fills in the details, saying that Jesus traveled to Hemus under the name of Isa. That is from William Douglas' book, Beyond the High Himalayas. Here then is the chronology of Jesus' life as we know it. He was born sometime between 8 and 4 BC. He spent his early life in Palestine. He may have moved to Memphis, Egypt shortly after his birth and lived there for three years. You remember it is written, out of Egypt have I called my son. So the scripture was fulfilled. He was called out of Egypt upon the death of Herod. Legends from the British Isles say that his great uncle Joseph of Arimathea, who took care of him after the death of Joseph, was a tin merchant with a fleet of ships who regularly sailed to the Isles. It is said that he took him to Glastonbury as a youth before he was 12 in the temple to be educated. At that time, the most famous universities in Europe were in Britain. They were the Druid universities. Now, sometimes we overlook the normal questions we should be asking. Where did Jesus learn and study to be so wise at the age of 12? Now, if you are of the view that he is simply automatically, contrary to all of the laws of our own lifetimes, automatically, having the knowledge of his time, other languages mastered, the memorization of the Old Testament and even apocryphal books that are not in the Old Testament, which he quotes. The knowledge that Jesus had is a knowledge that is gained through education. Wisdom is gained from God, but knowledge comes through education. I believe that Jesus had a very rich childhood was watched over carefully by his mother, by Joseph, and then Joseph of Arimathea, that he was fully prepared with all of the knowledge that our teenagers must wait till 18 to receive, and much, much more by the time he was age 12. I believe this profoundly because as I founded with Mark Prophet Montessori International, I see that children between the ages of birth and 12 have a tremendous capacity to absorb information, especially when we recognize that they are old souls having the full capacity of the mind of Christ, which is in Jesus. Understanding this, we understand that children following what Dr. Maria Montessori discovered, the sensitive periods, the unfoldment of that inner potential can truly 
gain a great mastery of outer knowledge and inner wisdom by the age of 12. This to me is fully in accord with what the master would have done. To walk through all of the steps and stages that we would walk through and to show us how life is to be lived from the hour of our birth onward in order that at the age of 33 and beyond we are truly ready for those initiations ordained which he followed beginning at that age of 30. These are the life cycles that most of us have missed because the lost years and the lost teachings are not seen as the foundation of child psychology and education and the evolution of the soul. Today we educate the mind or the mental body but the soul is often left to languish and it so languishes today that we find young people no longer have a reason for being and we face in America the dreadful problem of teen suicide and cluster suicides. We have to understand that when an individual is fulfilled in life here and now, he has no need to seek another world and another life or a means of escape. When he understands the inner contact of the living presence of God that Jesus had and wants all of us to have from our earliest childhood, he does not have to go after drugs and the titillation of the senses and all these experiences which take from him his innocence but moreover take from him the light of his chakras so that he can no longer commune with his God and receive those answers. It is very urgent, therefore, that all of us become the champions of the divine rights of children to internalize this light and understand that these children who take their lives are not all some castaways or bad souls that we shouldn't be worrying about. We should be worrying about them because they are very sensitive souls and light bearers, as well as those on the entire spectrum of Earth's evolution. We should realize that souls that are lost, whether in abortion, whether in suicide, whether through a faulty educational system, have come to participate in the salvation of this Earth because the Christ of every man, woman, and child is a potential living savior come to save some element, some field of knowledge or experience on earth. We have so many missing links in our civilization today that one wonders how we will ever emerge and rise into a golden age with so many passing from the screen of life in an untimely manner because we do not understand and guard this delicate journey of the soul. It was the occasion of the Passover when Jesus was discoursing with the doctors of the law even as it was a Passover time when he returned to face the crucifixion. There is no biblical record of Jesus' activities or whereabouts until he is baptized by John in the River Jordan at about age 30. That is a very important event to me because John said, I'm not worthy to baptize you. Jesus said, suffer it to be so now. To me, that is what he said all of his life. He wanted to go through the footsteps and stages of initiation that he could leave footprints in the sands. He went to the East to study as a student to prove to us humility placing ourselves before our teachers in every field and understanding that there is a culture, spiritual, physical, to be transferred wherever our field of endeavor is. It does not diminish the glory and the power of the Son of God to me to think that he studied before the great adepts of the Far East. It doesn't diminish his sonship, but it does enhance my understanding of my own. I now am beginning to see how I can work the works that Jesus did because I believe in the Christ in him, because I say to him, Yea, Lord, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God who should come into the world, and because I can affirm it in him, he can affirm it in me and in you. And if I deny that Christ in him, so I can expect that denial is the denial of my own Christhood. But if I deny it in you, I am also denying my own Christhood. 
There are no only sons of God. There is one son of God into whose cup we all drink and share. Jesus then said, suffer it to be so now. If you prefer to believe that he had all cosmic wisdom in the moment of birth, you may believe it, but you may understand he went to the Far East because we have a trek to make, not necessarily to the physical Himalayas, but we must climb the highest mountain of being. We must accelerate and go beyond the consciousness and worldliness. We must find the inner teachers and this through the Holy Spirit. We must drink of their cups, walk in their footsteps, be willing to understand that there is a price to be paid to carry the light and pay it. Someone has paid the price that we could sit here this evening. We must be ready to pay the price for our children and our youth. Therefore, that Jesus submitted to John the Baptist tells me he also submitted to the great lights of the Far East because he is the greatest light the summum bonum of all the world's religions, he rises to the highest awareness of all people's sense of the divine man incarnate. In the East, he was called the best of the sons of men. He came there and he proved and set the example of the culmination of where their religion would take them. And he went there to chasten, to scourge, the false priests who would keep this knowledge from the poor, not only the poor physically, but the poor in spirit who were waiting for the divine mysteries that were denied to them by those of spiritual pride that said you must not share the scriptures with the lowly ones, the lower castes. In challenging them, Jesus, therefore, had to escape from their midst because they sought to kill him. It was a reenactment, a rehearsal for what would take place in Palestine. Jesus was very sincere and in earnest that that final demonstration in Palestine would be for us an example of our own. So we went through it many times with the Hindus, the Buddhists, the Zoroastrians, and each time they were angry because the people loved him and he healed them. He mastered their sacred scriptures, told them what they meant, told them how they were misinterpreting them for the people, and gave that communion of the true teaching to the common people. Is not that what you would expect Jesus Christ to be doing for 17 years? Is not that the event that you would cherish to have yourself? If you would desire it, wouldn't you think that someone like you, your brother Jesus, would go and do the same thing? When you have a great mission in life, don't you prepare and go to college and get your degree and practice and get ready for the day when you can make a major contribution in your field? That's because in the very ethers of the planet, that course of study and mastery and giving of service yet remains, even if it is not in scripture. There are actually no facts to support the theory that Jesus lived in Palestine during the 17 or more lost years. But the ancient Buddhist manuscripts written by historians, not religious men, say clearly that he spent those lost years. This is the chronology that they list. And this is the chronology that is passed down by the oral tradition. At age 13, he departed Jerusalem with merchants and set out towards sin with the object of perfecting himself in the divine word and of studying the laws of the great Buddhas. Who are the great Buddhas? They are simple people and life streams like you and me of the Far East who sought to embody that universal Christ. And the term Buddha means one enlightened by that universal one, one whose consciousness has budded and opened, whose seven chakras have become orifices for the receiving and the distributing of that light. At 14, Jesus crossed the Sindh. This is a region in present-day southeast Pakistan in the lower Indus River Valley. He then established himself among the Aryas, or Aryans. Some say among these were at least one of the lost tribes of Israel. Jesus' fame spread and the Jains asked him to stay with them. 
but he went instead to juggernaut India, where the white priests of Brahma bade him a joyous welcome. Have you ever thought or considered that perhaps the places of India are holy because our Lord was there just as the places of Palestine are holy because our Lord was there? Seventeen years is a long time in a territory to leave your footprints. You can stand where it is said Jesus stood outside of Rome on the Apian Way today. And that is where Peter stood. He was leaving the city. And Jesus was walking toward the city. This is the ascended master Jesus. And Peter saw him and he said, Where are you going, Lord? Quo vadis? That is the place. And Jesus said to him, I am going to Rome to be crucified again. And thereby Peter knew that Jesus would go to Rome in him, and it is Peter who would be crucified. So he went back to fulfill that calling. There is a church built there where they say Jesus stood. You can place your hands in the place where he, they say he stood, and you can feel a charge of spiritual energy go through your entire body. You can feel it on Bethany's hill from where he ascended also, and other places. So why wouldn't you feel that charge of light going to the far east? So we understand that where the holy are, so space and time can be consecrated because they have released the sacred fire of the inner light. The priests at Juggernaut taught him to read and understand the Vedas. Whether you think he allowed them to teach him to suffer it to be so now, or whether you think that he needed that education, there are rituals in life, you know, and great masters submit to those rituals because they want us to do them too, and they know if they do not do them, we will say, well, the great master didn't do it, so why should we do it? That's why we must always be a good example. So he was taught to understand them, to cure by the aid of prayer, to teach, to explain the Holy Scriptures to the people, to drive out evil spirits from the bodies of men, restoring unto them their sanity. Age 14 to 20, the Buddhist texts say, Jesus spent six years at Juggernaut, Raja Griha, Benares, and other holy cities. He eventually became embroiled in the conflict with the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas, the priestly and warrior castes, as I mentioned, teaching the holy scriptures to the lower castes. His enemies plotted to kill him. At age 21, he left Juggernaut by night and went to the foothills of the Himalayas in southern Nepal, the birthplace of Gautama. 500 years before, Gautama Buddha had taught, had achieved enlightenment, had internalized the word. Does that detract from the Son of God? No, it enhances the Son of God because it tells us what man has done, man can do. That along the lines of history for millions of years throughout a matter cosmos, the soul that descends has found a way to internalize a higher light and to ascend. There is hope for all of us, not merely because we believe in Jesus Christ, but that we believe in the Christ of him and in his promise that we must do the greater works, for he has ascended to the Father. Age 21 to 27, Jesus spent six years in Nepal where he mastered the Pali language. He became a perfect expositor of the sacred writings. Sometime during his sojourn in the East, Jesus also traveled to Lhasa, Ladakh, Rajputana, and Kabul in present-day Afghanistan. Between 27 and 29, he left the Himalayas and journeyed west, preaching along the way. He passed through Persia where he also rebuked the false priesthood of Zoroastrianism who in turn cast him out of their town in hopes that he would fall prey to the wild beasts. 
Age 29, Jesus returned to Palestine. He had filled his cup full, he had fully prepared, he was ready. I think you and I know what it means to feel ready for the work that God has called us to do. And we know when we're not prepared and when we must prepare more because we sense the challenge will be great. I think that in our time we are facing the greatest challenges of all time. No time in our entire evolution has it been more important for us to place our attention on the internalization of this living word. Published then in my work, The Lost Years of Jesus, are three translations of these Buddhist texts. The Notavish work, which was discovered in 1887 and first published in 1894. This is printed in its entirely in this volume. For the first time, Abedananda's version, which was discovered in 1922 and published in 1929, has been put into English for this volume. Three translators in Los Angeles work diligently on this out of the love of their hearts that this Abedananda translation might be in English. We have the notes from Rorick's 1925 travel diary. Each of these agree with and complement the other. As Nicholas Rorick made his journey of five years, he stopped by the way and he painted magnificent paintings of the places where Jesus walked. The first two you see are of legends, Isa and the Skull of the Giant, a most magnificent depicting of how big evil appears to be and how much we have to understand it is the fire of the heart and of the mind that allows us to challenge evil no matter how monstrous it may appear. It does bow before the light of the Son of God. And then he did the painting of signs of Christ. And there are a few others I'd like you to see. Please take out this stump booklet. As we are talking about the assimilation of the life of Jesus, I think it's a moment to give an affirmation of that Christ being the I am where we are and to fill our hearts with love and prayer and real conversation with our Lord. Talk to Jesus in the secret chamber in your heart as you sing on page 20 of the stump booklet number 76, I am the Christ in action here.
We are going to sing now to the one Jeremiah saw as the Lord our righteousness, the one who is the real self, the Holy Christ self of each one of us. This is the foundation of the sacred mystery that has become the lost teaching of Jesus, the personal Christ self that is your personal mediator, teacher, friend, brother, and divine spouse, and the alchemical marriage of the soul who becomes the bride of this Christ is with that one who is focalized and personified where you are, but there is only one universal Christ. It is that individualized presence of God whose voice you acknowledge as the inner voice of conscience, the inner voice of warning, the inner voice that says no and yes, and when you follow it, you are happy, and when you don't, you truly find out why you should have before long. The Holy Christ flame and the Holy Christ self are one. The flame is the divine spark, and out of the flame is the person of Christ. So on the same page, we sing, Thou Holy Christ flame within my heart, number 74. I'm going to keep the lights on. These are psalms. They are songs of praise and of affirmation and of the release of power. The mystery teachings of Jesus, which he gave to his inner circle, are for the igniting of this light that is within. The key to this mystery, as we shall hear about in these teachings, is the call. The call we receive from the Master, and the call that is made by our own soul. As you can see, the words of these songs are calls, they are prayers, they are affirmations. The introit to the Holy Christ flame on the same page has the effect then of calling forth the divine spark and the flame on the altar of the heart. As we nourish the flame, the flame increases the flame is the focus of our consciousness of Christ and our God. As we adore the light, so the light increases here below. The home of the light is on high, and therefore, if we would have it here below in our temple, we must use the power of the word that God gave us to affirm it, to direct it, to love it, to expand it, to talk to it, the same way life is nourished, whether it is a plant or a child or an animal. We must give our attention to the light and the light will increase. So in great love for your Holy Christ self, let us sing this introit. 
We pray, O Holy Christ, self of each one, that you shall unfold the mystery of Christ's ascension within these such fervent souls, O God. They have gathered to know thee. Let them know thee as thou art through the blessed mediator, our beloved Holy Christ self. O flame that burns in my heart with an intensity and a fire, O God. So in that presence and in that flame, our Lord and his disciples walk and talk with us in this hour as on the road to Emmaus. How do we know that there are lost teachings of Jesus? First of all, we know by the flame that burns in our hearts. In this gentle communion with you, where we all have our one-pointed attention on Jesus, when we dwell in his sacred heart, I must witness to you the physical burning that is a great sphere in my own heart and chest cavity that so intensifies as the presence of the Lord. And I must tell you that this is also a presence of an ancient memory that I had many years ago of being with Jesus as his disciple Martha, Martha and Mary and Lazarus of Bethany received Jesus in their home and were part of the inner circle with Mary Magdalene, Mother Mary, and many others who received these very lost teachings. So apart from what I shall give to you as documentation, I truly must witness to this Lord who I know is my Savior. And I will tell you why. Because he has saved my soul for the victory that is his own. 
and without Jesus and his teaching and his anointing of me, I know that I might not find my way out of this veil of tears and suffering, temptation and trial. I know that Jesus is the living Savior because he has saved us to work out our salvation by understanding that he can truly live in our temple, that we can work his works, and because he lives in this temple and increases the fire of the heart in us, because he is with the Father who is also with us, he multiplies our work, our work multiplied by Jesus, or our work multiplying Jesus' work, is the formula and the equation whereby we then see greater works than he did 2,000 years ago are being done today because he is with that presence with us. Not only that, but because the karma of the earth is greater, the burdens of the world are greater, the population of the earth is greater, the challenges of our time are greater. So without this Master and Lord with me, I am nothing, I could do nothing. With his quickening spirit, I may also know that Christ is with me and you. I consider myself then a born-again Christian, having been born again 2,000 years ago when he worked his miracles before me, gave me the prophecy of our time, told me not only would his teachings and years be lost, but his healings, and therefore the lost arts of healing has become the subject of other seminars that I hold, as well as our 12-week retreats at the Royal Teton Ranch Summit University. The lost arts of Jesus' healing are greatly needed today because of so much burden of karma in the flesh of terminal diseases. Those of you who have compassion for the sick, know the sick, or have infirmities, must realize that through the lost teaching we discover the lost healing arts. So I would tell you then of what I have recorded for those who need to see and understand the proof that there are lost teachings. The clues begin right where they ought to begin in the New Testament, right where they ought to begin merely because that New Testament has left out a lot. And if you read it with objectivity, you can clearly see where the story leaves off and doesn't pick up again because somebody took it out. Or maybe it was never there in the first place because it was a mystery or a secret teaching which Jesus only reveals by initiation, heart to heart and fire to fire. A small number of verses actually record Jesus' teaching. At least 16 passages show him teaching, but do not say what he taught. At least 10 other passages imply that not all of what he said on a particular occasion is recorded. Have you ever been frustrated to read that he taught them for many days, but then no teaching is there? What did he say? There were post-resurrection teachings. Acts says Jesus taught for 40 days of things pertaining to the kingdom of God between the resurrection and the ascension. That is why we celebrate Jesus' ascension today. It is 40 days from Easter. He tutored Paul. He gave John the book of Revelation after the resurrection. There is evidence that he spent many years on earth after the resurrection. Church father Irenaeus says that Jesus taught until he was 40 or 50 years old. The third century Gnostic gospel, Pistis Sophia, says that when Jesus had risen from the dead, he passed 11 years discoursing with his disciples. We have no record and no teaching. There are missing source documents for the Gospels. Scholars have concluded that the Gospelers worked from a diverse body of source documents and oral tradition. They have postulated the existence of Q, the Little Apocalypse, a Proto-Mark and Proto-Luke, as well as other documents. The oral tradition about Jesus is also missing. Papias, the bishop of Hierapolis, who lived from 70 to 155 AD, 
wrote down the words of the apostles and other eyewitnesses to Jesus' life. All but a fragment of his work was destroyed. We know that he wrote because of that fragment. There is a lack of literature produced by Jesus' disciples, his close friends, and by Jesus himself. It is highly unlikely that they were all illiterate. It is unlikely by what we already know about Jesus' journey to the Far East, or in the British Isles, or in Egypt, that he was illiterate. In the Roman Empire, literacy was common even among the lower classes. The New Testament was edited and altered, both by its authors, who desired to keep certain teaching from the uninitiated, and by scribes and church fathers, who desired to preserve their orthodoxy, in my opinion, to control the people, to control their faith and their knowledge. We believe that Jesus deliberately kept his inner teachings from the masses, because we read in Mark 4, 10 to 12, that he told his disciples, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all things are done in parables. Mark 4.34 says that when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. A fragment of a secret gospel of Mark was discovered in 1958 by scholar Morton Smith. It was at Marsaba, a monastery in the Judean desert. This is proof that the inner teachings existed. Smith found the gospel quoted in an ancient letter written by Church Father Clement of Alexandria around 200 AD. This is a tremendous find for those who understand the personal path of Christhood, who are the mystics of this age. In this letter, Clement revealed that the Apostle Mark had composed a more spiritual gospel for the use of those who were being perfected. The word is perfected. You remember Jesus said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. The path of self-perfectionment does not mean a flesh and blood perfection. Who of us could pass the test of flesh and blood or human perfection? The human consciousness, the human being, is not made to be perfect. The perfectionment we are speaking of is the soul and the qualities of virtue of the soul that God recognizes as perfection are not the virtues that are demanded of the human in this world. Therefore, we can understand that there is a part of us that right now is being perfected, even if the outer self may continue to err and be human. In Clement's time, this gospel was carefully guarded quote, being read only to those who are being initiated into the great mysteries. So we have an inkling here of an inner path of initiation transmitted from master to disciple. It is the guru chila or master-disciple relationship that has existed for tens of thousands of, e of years in the Far East and on the ancient lost continents of Lemuria, Atlantis, and pre-Golden Ages, even before those records. This inner walk with the inner Christ is confirmed in this document. Smith's fragment describes a secret baptism and initiation rite which Jesus administers to a youth believed by Smith to be Lazarus. Most scholars accept the authenticity of the secret gospel of Mark. The question is, how many other secret Gospels like this one existed and are now lost? One feels no loss in itself, beloved, because when you are ready, the Master reveals the mysteries. This is the hour of our readiness and of His coming. The true mysteries are not lost. This is the great joy and message I come to deliver to you in this hour for the mysteries themselves and the Christ is your deliverer. Aside from intentional deletions, some teaching was also deleted over the centuries through the mistakes of copyists who made mistakes and corrected 
what they perceive to be mistakes. Now, if you don't understand something, you think it's a mistake, don't you? So you just correct it so it reads right according to how you think it should be stated. But we know that the ancient mysteries may be a question of a verb, tense, a pronoun, a very small difference in how something is said or written. This can be seen in the thousands of New Testament manuscripts we possess and the thousands of Bible quotes preserved in ancient writings which differ from each other in over 250,000 ways. How can you say this version of the Bible or this copy of the Bible is the absolute truth? As Mark used to say, even in our own time, we've had so many, many different translations. The Gospels were also edited for theological reasons. Codex Sinaiticus, one of the oldest Bibles in the world, written about 340 AD, differs in significant ways from the canonical text we have today. Scholar James Bentley gives an example of the editing. He points out that in the first chapter of Mark's Gospel, we are told of a leper who says to Jesus, if you will, you can make me clean. Codex Sinaiticus continues, Jesus, quote, angry, stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I will be clean. Later manuscripts, perceiving that to attribute anger to Jesus at this point made him appear perhaps too human, alter the word angry to the words moved with compassion. In our scripture today, we have Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand. Now, if you understand the meaning of divine wrath and divine compassion, they actually are not much different. The anger which Jesus experienced, I don't consider to be human. Although I, I believe that Jesus could become humanly angry and I wouldn't uh, cite him for that. But what I feel in the presence of someone as a leper possessed of demons is the wrath of God against those demons about to devour them and cast them out in a ritual of exorcism. I can also feel the annoyance of the very presence of those demons and the uncleanness of the temple of a so-called leper who might be someone crazed and possessed today. So those are reactions we feel because we have a human body. It doesn't mean that the Christ operates any less through us because of it. But the very act of casting them out, of course, is divine love for the one who is possessed, and it is the divine wrath for the demons themselves who are bound and removed. So, as we say, if one does not understand the meaning, one may change the words, but the record is there yet to be read. Everything that Jesus ever did or said is in Akasha. That which is secret teaching is veiled and kept sealed by the angels of God until Jesus desires to release it. A collection of Gnostic writings discovered at Nag Hammadi, Egypt in 1945 may also contain some of Jesus' lost teachings. Not all of these Gospels are authentic, but some are at least as old as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They were excluded from our Bible not because they had been proven fraudulent, but simply because the Church Fathers did not like them. It is my opinion and conclusion that the Church Fathers did not like these documents or the truth of Jesus' lost years because it would give to the individual knowledge. And knowledge is independence. And knowledge becomes self-knowledge gnosis. And when you have self-knowledge, you understand the relationship of yourself to God, to the universe, to your fellow man. And suddenly you understand that your salvation as heaven or hell is not dependent upon organized religion or a priest or a minister or a rabbi. This to this day enrages organized religion but I speak it in any case because I am the champion of your divine rights. Consider then if the Roman Church would hide from us 17 years of Jesus' life, 
if it would edit the Bible and delete whole books to preserve its orthodoxy, to what extent would it not go? If somebody has so little love for the real Lord and Savior that they will not tell the world about the 17 years most important because they were immediately preceding Jesus' mission, then why would they have any compunctions about omitting any teaching whatsoever that was not consistent with their motive of controlling all Christendom to the present? When we realize this, that of course this happened before Protestantism happened, then those who are Protestants today, who still have this teaching and these years and these mysteries denied to them, you are still carrying, therefore, the banner of Rome. If you are truly to be liberated from those who keep from you the true teachings, then you must recognize that Protestantism inherited the absence of the truth and yet had stripped from it more of the truth in the denial of the saints in heaven, the heavenly hosts, the ascended masters, and the angels. Now this communion with those saints and heavenly hosts is also your divine right. So Christianity today is stripping from us more and more and more of the whole loaf and the full-bodied wheat of it. This then is a brief overview of what you'll find in much greater detail at the beginning of the lost teachings of Jesus. Now I'm about to give to you the story from Pistis Sophia, this Gnostic text of Jesus' ascension. It's a story that is much different than that which we heard read from the scriptures, the gospels with which we began our evening. I would like to give you an opportunity for a break to return and hear this story and to also have the dictation of Jesus Christ this evening. Pistis Sophia. You may be wondering what that means. Well, it is a third century Gnostic text written in a Coptic, that is, in an Egyptian dialect and probably originally composed in Greek. It was first published in 1851. It is consistent with the Gnostic tradition that Jesus continued to teach his disciples following his resurrection and ascension. His Sophia relates long conversations between the disciples and the risen Jesus about hitherto unveiled mysteries and about the fall of the heavenly being called Pistis Sophia, whose name means faith wisdom. The opening words of the first book tell us that when Jesus had risen from the dead, he passed 11 years discoursing with his disciples. In the 12th year, he ascended into heaven, then returned again to give his final teaching. The intended implication is that the text of Pistis Sophia is a higher form of teaching than either Jesus' public preaching before the crucifixion or the 11 years of teaching following his resurrection. Here then is the scene of Jesus' ascension as recorded in Pistis Sophia. It came to pass then when the disciples were sitting together on the Mount of Olives speaking of these words and rejoicing in great joy and exulting exceedingly and saying one to another, Blessed are we before all men who are on the earth, because the Savior hath revealed this unto us, and we have received the fullness and the total completion. They said this to one another while Jesus sat a little removed from them. And it came to pass then on the fifteenth day of the moon in the month Tibi, which is the day on which the moon is full, on that day then when the sun had come forth in his going, that there came forth behind him a great light power, shining most exceedingly, and there was no measure to the light conjoined with the sun. For it came out of the light of lights, and it came out of the last mystery, which is the four and twentieth mystery, from within without, 
those which are in the orders of the second space of the first mystery. And that light power came down over Jesus and surrounded him entirely while he was seated removed from his disciples. And he had shown most exceedingly and there was no measure for the light which was on him. And the disciples had not seen Jesus because of the great light in which he was or which was about him. For their eyes were darkened because of the great light in which he was. But they saw only the light which shot forth many light rays. And these light rays were not like one another, but the light was of diverse kind, and it was of diverse type from below upwards, one ray more excellent than the other in one great immeasurable glory of light. It stretched from under the earth right up to heaven, and when the disciples saw that light, they fell into great fear and great agitation. It came to pass then when that light power had come down over Jesus, that it gradually surrounded him entirely. Then Jesus ascended or soared into the height shining most exceedingly in an immeasurable light. And, it, and the disciples gazed after him, and none of them spake until he had reached into heaven, but they all kept in deep silence. This then came to pass on the fifteenth day of the moon, on the day on which it is full in the month Tibi. It came to pass then when Jesus had reached the heaven after three hours, that all the powers of the heaven fell into agitation, and all were set in motion one against the other. They and all their eons and all their regions and all their orders, and the whole earth was agitated, and all they who dwell thereon. And all men who are in the world fell into agitation, and also the disciples and all thought, her adventure the world will be rolled up. And all the powers in the heavens ceased not from their agitation, they and the whole world. And all were moved one against the other from the third hour of the fifteenth day of the moon of Tibi until the ninth hour of the morrow. And all the angels and their archangels and all the powers of the height all sang praises to the interiors of the interiors, so that the whole world heard their voices without their ceasing till the ninth hour of the morrow. But the disciples sat together in fear and were in exceedingly great agitation and were afraid because of the great earthquake which took place. And they wept together, saying, What will then be? Peradventure the Savior will destroy all regions. Thus saying, they wept together. While they then said this and wept together then, on the ninth hour of the morrow, the heavens opened and they saw Jesus descend shining most exceedingly, and there was no measure for his light in which he was, for he shone more radiantly at the hour when he had ascended to the heavens, so that men in the world cannot describe the light which was on him. And it shot forth light rays in great abundance, and there was no measure for its rays, and its light was not alike together, but it was of diverse kind and of diverse type, some rays being more excellent than others. And the whole light consisted together. It was of threefold kind, and the one kind was more excellent than the other. The second, that in the midst, was more excellent than the first, which was below. And the third, which was above them all, was more excellent than the two which were below. And the first glory which was placed below them all was like to the light which had come over Jesus before he had ascended into the heavens, and was like only itself in its light. And the three light modes were of diverse light kinds, and they were of diverse type, one being more excellent than the other. And it came to pass then, when the disciples saw this, that they feared exceedingly and were in agitation. Then Jesus, the compassionate and tender-hearted, when he saw his disciples, that they were in great agitation, spake with them, saying, Take courage, it is I, be not afraid. It came to pass then when the disciples had heard this word that they said, 
Lord, if it be thou, withdraw thy light glory into thyself, that we may be able to stand. Otherwise our eyes are darkened and we are agitated and the whole world also is in agitation because of the great light which is about thee. Then Jesus drew to himself the glory of his light and when this was done, all the disciples took courage, stepped forward to Jesus, fell down all together, adored him, rejoicing in great joy and said unto him, Rabbi, whither hast thou gone, or what was thy ministry on which thou hast gone, or wherefore rather were all these confusions and all the earthquakings which have taken place? Then Jesus the Compassionate said unto them, Rejoice and exult from this hour on, for I have gone to the regions out of which I had come forth. From this day on then will I discourse with you in openness from the beginning of the truth unto its completion. And I will discourse with you face to face without similitude. From this hour on will I not hide anything from you of the mystery of the height and of that of the region of truth. For authority hath been given me through the ineffable and through the first mystery of all mysteries to speak with you from the beginning right up to the fullness, both from within, without, and from without, within. Hearken therefore, that I may tell you all things. This then is the account that comes from the Gnostics. Why was this account not included in the New Testament. It is a long story, some of which I have related to you at our Easter conference in Dallas, some of which I have spoken about last July 6th in Los Angeles. So I will tell you a little more about this story now. As you know then, Gnosticism, which is spelled G-N-O-S-T-I-C-I-S-M, has been used to describe a group of diverse religious movements that existed first within Christianity and then as a rival of it, especially during the second century AD, when standards for Christian belief and practices had not yet been clearly defined for us. Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, meaning knowledge. The Gnostics sought self-knowledge of the inner Christ, pointed to the disciples by Jesus himself. It is considered that even the Apostle Paul was a Gnostic. He makes very clear that he learned all things from Jesus himself who personally taught him, and even the scriptures themselves note that Paul was initiated on the road to Damascus, he was blinded by Jesus and then healed, raised up to be an apostle, and through him the power of the Holy Spirit flowed. We find then that this apostle Paul was taught by Jesus over many years, and our inner reading of the records of Akasha shows that he was taken up when he spent that period of his life on the Arabian desert into the etheric or heaven world retreat of Jesus that is to this day over the Holy Land. And there, in that inner tutoring of his soul, Paul received the fullness of the mysteries of Christ. He was greatly empowered as the greatest of the apostles to spread Christianity. You can read about the Apostle Paul in our paperback book, Lords of the Seven Rays, which also tells you how you can journey to these etheric or heaven world retreats of the masters as your soul journeys out of the body during sleep at night. The lords of the seven rays are masters, brothers of Jesus, servants, sons in heaven, whom Jesus revealed to us many years ago, who assist him in teaching the path of personal Christhood. Lords of the seven rays tells us how each of these masters prepares us to receive the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit through the Sacred Heart of Jesus. 
So then, the Apostle Paul, being a Gnostic, did teach a way of self-knowledge. And we find in many of his epistles glimpses of the truth that remain. Self-knowledge, then, was the gift to the inner circle. The idea that there could be an inner circle of initiates who might be more advanced, more in touch with the Lord than those who determined to establish the Christian Church and Orthodoxy was simply unacceptable. Therefore, for purposes of power and holding the power in this world of the authority of Christ, these teachings have not come down as a tradition. The Gnostics then emphasized knowledge as the means to salvation. Jesus has taught us that salvation means self-elevation, not the lower self elevated, but Christ in you elevated. The elevation of Christ in you is the means to salvation. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. The I he spoke of is the I am. The I am that I am or the living presence of God. It is the light. So he taught the inner circle. The early church fathers put the entire emphasis of salvation on faith. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. This is the common parlance of Christianity today. Conversion begins with believing in Jesus Christ or believing that Christ was embodied in him, for that is the open door for the same experience for each one of us. It begins here, but it is fulfilled in the self-knowledge of that Christ. There is nothing to be denied of what outer Christianity has to say. There is only to be added the inner mysteries whereby every man sits under his own vine and fig tree, his own I am presence and holy Christ self. So now I would like to show you the chart of your divine self so you can see in this diagram what the Gnostics were teaching. Before we go to it, we looked at Jesus and Magda. This is a chart of your divine self, the inner self that must be raised up. It shows the Trinity where you are. It shows the manifestation of the Father in the upper sphere, the Son in the middle figure who is the mediator, who is the universal Christ, and you as the soul who has descended from heaven in the lower figure. The inner mysteries teach us that we as the lower figure must invoke the Holy Spirit whose flame descends to us in a spiritual baptism with a color of violet. This violet is the aura of the saints and it can become your aura as you invoke it. As we proceed with the workshops and the lectures of this weekend, you will learn how to invoke the violet flame of the Holy Spirit for that internal cleansing, balancing of karma, healing of diseases by the healing of the records or causes of diseases. So we can see that there is a glory that may shine through us, which is of the Holy Spirit. There is a glory of the Son of God that comes through the mediator, the Holy Christ self, the middle figure, and there is the glory of the Father, the I Am Presence. We read of the three glories of light that were upon Jesus, signifying three glories of initiation of the highest octaves into which he ascended and from which he descended. Now this is the teaching of Jesus that is lost. It is the teaching given to us again as the everlasting gospel. And as you listen to the teachings that are recorded in the Gnostic texts, you will begin to see just how relevant is this chart. I'd like you to meditate it upon it for a while because as you meditate upon it and give and pour forth your love to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, you actually open the channels of your being to receive that light. So I'll speak to you a little bit more as we meditate upon the chart. This gnosis or self-knowledge was not an intellectual, rational knowing, but a knowledge of oneself, of God and of the world, and an understanding of their relationship to each other. 
The Gnostics consider themselves the keepers of Christ's inner teachings passed down to them by his disciples. They also believe that after Jesus' resurrection, he continued to reveal higher spiritual mysteries not only to chosen apostles and disciples, but to all who would become quickened to his message and mission. They claim that this progressive revelation was imparted through visions, dreams, or direct communication with a person of Christ. The Gnostics wrote down these teachings as collections of sayings, parables and proverbs, exhortations or sermons, interpretations of scripture, stories or dialogues between Jesus and one of the disciples. The dialogues, often written in the name of a disciple or a biblical figure, did not necessarily include the words of the disciple himself, but were written, for example, in the spirit of Philip, John, or Mary Magdalene as a continuation of their original experience of communion with the Master. Now we're going to look at the painting of Jesus at his resurrection with beloved Magda. This is a painting to me that is typically Gnostic in character if you understand the principle here. First of all, it should be understood that Jesus chose Mary Magdalene and not the apostles as the first one to see him after his resurrection. Now the claim to orthodoxy today rests upon the testimony of the supposed eyewitnesses, all of whom were men, the apostles. But as a matter of fact, Jesus gave to beloved Magda the revelation of his resurrection. Now this particular moment captures the fire of the resurrection initiation, not merely the ascension. The ascension comes 40 days later, so we are not seeing him in the ascension pose. She reaches out her hand, and you remember the words he spoke, touch me not, for I am not ascended unto my God and your God, unto my Father and your Father. Now in those very simple words, we realize that Jesus has a God presence and Mary Magdalene has a God presence. And that God presence is the presence of the Father, the I Am presence, which I just showed to you, above Jesus and above Mary Magdalene. How else can you explain his very statement? He is acknowledging the individualization of the God presence for each one. And he is saying, I have not yet accelerated into that sacred fire. I am in the midst of that initiation. Touch me not. Jesus was very careful about touching. As you know, the woman who touched the hem of his garment, he said, I perceive virtue is gone out of me. So when you carry a great light in the aura, that light is transferred to those whom you touch. So you can use your hands for blessing and healing, or you can seal the aura in periods of meditation and increase of the light. Here then is the soul, typical of Pistis Sophia, faith wisdom. She has fallen from heaven into the plains of matter, into density. She has lost the way. She has received the call of her Lord. He has cast out of her seven devils. He has raised her up. She has been a part of the inner circle. And within the Gnostic text, we do have the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, which I read and taught to you at the Easter conference, which is available on tape. So Mary Magdalene begins to give the inner mysteries in that gospel of the initiations of the seven chakras. This then is a picture of self-knowledge. And what is being imparted by Jesus in the great tradition of the raising up of the light of God is this is the initiation of the crucifixion and the resurrection. As I have done it, so shall you. 2,000 years later, reincarnated during that period of 2,000 years in this century, Mary Magdalene, re-embodied, did experience her final incarnation on earth, was resurrected, and did make her ascension. Now many of you feel and know within your heart that this life and this century is the hour of your union with God. I know because I read your hearts and I know because I speak all over the world and people who are called in this hour to this initiation know it from within 
and are only waiting for the step-by-step -step teachings to be certain that they will fulfill all of the law and drink the whole cup. I would like to then show you how the chakras or spiritual centers are placed in your body so you can be thinking about these in terms of Jesus' initiation. This is the lower figure in the chart depicted as the runner. You remember there's an angel in Revelation that has a foot upon the land and a foot upon the sea. Well, this individual was not intended to be that angel, but maybe an angel in any case, as Jesus and Paul said to us, be, be then not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. This is a reference to the teaching that angels have taken embodiment and that angels have come to earth and are wearing forms as ours to be teachers. So we find that among spiritual movements there are any number of people who are embodied angels, good angels rather than fallen angels, who are actually understanding their mission to be teacher. So this is the runner in the race that Paul speaks of running for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus and taking dominion over the sea and over the earth, the lower elements of this octave. These seven chakras and the seven colors are taught as a part of our seminar this weekend. We have another lecture coming up on the meditation of the seven chakras, which I will be giving to you. These represent seven planes of being, seven planes of heaven, seven major initiations. Jesus spoke of all these things to the inner circle. He sealed them in their hearts, these mysteries, for the hour when 2,000 years later they would be published abroad and made available. It's a very interesting thing about the publishing of the mysteries and the teachings. We have seen that those who are quickened by God fully comprehend and understand the mysteries that are written. Those who are not quickened by the Lord may read these books and not understand a word of them and not have any understanding of why anyone would read these books or get anything out of them. So it is amazing to see that though they are published abroad, they are given individually when the pupil is ready. According to what modern scholars have been able to piece together, the atmosphere in which most of these writings had been produced was one of inner conflict and diversity within the church. Although history has branded the Gnostics as heretics, they were at first fully a part of the emerging Christian community, offering the larger body of Christians a higher interpretation and understanding of the Lord's teaching. At a certain point when the understanding of the Lord's teaching and the teachings of the Gnostics themselves began to gain popularity, some ecclesiastics decided that the Gnostic version of Christian teaching and practice was not valid or accurate. These churchmen, who was, whose goal was to consolidate authority and stabilize Christian tradition into a unified and codified set of beliefs, denounced the Gnostic writings as blasphemous forgeries and challenged them in lengthy refutations. By the fourth century, the ecclesiastical leadership had gained enough power to override the Gnostic alternative. They expelled the Gnostics from the church as heretics and burned their works. These measures were largely successful. Very little of the prolific literature produced by the Gnostics has survived to the present. Until the late 19th century, we had to depend solely on secondhand reports of Gnostic teachings preserved in the writings of their enemies. The first two original Gnostic manuscripts, Codex Ascuanus and Codex Brucianus, were actually acquired by two British collectors in the 18th century. But these rare and precious documents remained untranslated, the first for about 80 years and the second for 120 years. As we have already mentioned, some of the lost teachings of the Gnostics were discovered in 1945 when an Arab peasant accidentally discovered and broke open an earthenware jar containing 13 papyrus books bound in leather. These ancient manuscripts representing 52 individual texts, almost all of them previously unknown, were discovered near Nag Hammadi, Egypt, 
a village located about 60 miles north of Luxor, Egypt, along the Nile River. They were Coptic translations made in about 350 AD from original Greek texts that may date as far back as the first or early second century. Coptic then is a vernacular form of the Egyptian language used by the earliest Egyptian Christians. Some scholars have speculated that a monk from a nearby monastery hid the banned Gnostic manuscripts in the jar around 400 AD to prevent them from being destroyed. Although in one sense the aim of the Gnostic was gnosis or knowledge, knowledge of the true self, we gain a higher understanding of where their sights were set from one of the first Gnostic translators and authorities, G.R.S. Mead. Mead explains that one of the Gnostics' earliest existing documents expressly declares that Gnosis is not the end, it is the beginning of the path, the end is God. And hence the Gnostics would be those who used the Gnosis as the means to set their feet upon the way to God. They strove for the knowledge of God, the science of realities, the gnosis of the things that are. Wisdom was their goal, the holy things of life their study. Third century father, Hippolytus, wrote that the Gnostic's desire was no more to come into being. In other words, their goal was freedom from the round of rebirth. Even the Orthodox Bible preserves Jesus' teaching on reincarnation. As he taught it to the disciples when they came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, they had seen Moses and they had seen Elias discoursing with Jesus during his transfiguration. They knew the Old Testament prophecy that before the coming of the Son of God, Elias must first come. So they were puzzled that he was in heaven. So they said to him, what about Elias? And Jesus said to him, he has already come, and they have done to him what they would. Then the disciples knew that he spake to them of John the Baptist. John the Baptist had already come and been beheaded by Herod. And so he was restored to heaven. He was an ascended master. That was John the Baptist's final ascension. Therefore, we see the ascended master John the Baptist, and we see Moses. Was Moses an ascended master? Yes, he was, but he had reincarnated a number of times, once in the Far East as Lord Ling, before he took his ascension. You remember Moses did not see the Promised Land. He saw it, but he could not enter it because he had killed the Egyptian slave master. So we find from this that that sin of having killed the Egyptian taskmaster had to be worked out as a karma. Moses was not freed from the round of rebirth. But at the time of Jesus' transfiguration, he had fulfilled that, was an ascended master, and appeared to the apostles in the form they would recognize him as Moses. So there we understand that the question of where is Elias and when is he coming was discussed by the Master and the disciples in the context of reincarnation. So here we find in Gnosticism the same teaching. The same teaching, of course, is that we reincarnate until the soul is perfected or balances her karma, fulfills her reason for being, expands the light in these seven chakras, and therefore when that light becomes so great, it is the Father and the Son who come down and dwell in the temple of that soul. Jesus says this in the Orthodox Bible. He says, those who love me and keep my commandments, that is, loving the Christ of me, the Father and the Son will take up their abode in that one. Jesus means your God and my God your Father and my Father, the I Am Presence, the Christ of you and the Christ of me, which are one, will come to live in your temple because when you are obedient to the law of Christ, it is an inner geometry. The light of that Christ in you, in loving obedience to that inner blueprint of your soul, becomes a grid. The Father and the Son cannot resist because it is a divine mathematics. 
Out of that word comes the mathematics. Things equal to the same thing are equal to each other. And therefore, if we have the Father and Son in our hearts in that loving obedience, and they dwell in us, that means that the three figures in the chart have now become one. And this soul, your soul, my soul, is then ready at the conclusion of that life and mission, and mission to ascend into the I Am Presence, never more to go out again because the soul has gone through the alchemical marriage with the bridegroom. So this is the meaning of the descent and the ascent. The soul descends into this world, must put on that which she left behind, the fullness of the glory of God, and return to the point of origin.